Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be our sports nutrition part two to the chapter on the digestive system. In the first video, we went over the basics. We talked about the functions of the digestive system, and then we talked about uh, the digestive tract. We went organ by organ, talked about its general structure and then function. And then we also talked about the accessory organs and their general structure and function. So here we are for part two. Excuse me. Um, in this part, we are going to be getting a little bit more specific. So now that we know the basics of digestion and absorption, we're going to talk about carbs, fat, and protein and how those may differ in their digestion and absorption. And we will also talk about digestion and absorption as it relates to exercise. So our first point of discussion would be enzymes. Not so fast, my friend, says Lee Corso. College football game day. There we go. We need these chemicals called enzymes. Everyone's heard of enzymes. Well, enzymes are little proteins because remember, one of the functions of proteins is to form chemicals. So enzymes are little proteins. And what they do is, is they catalyze, which is a fancy word for speed up chemical reactions. And those chemical reactions include chemical digestion. So enzymes, these little chemicals made up of protein, these little enzymes that speed up chemical reactions. Now, technically, the chemical reactions would still happen even without the enzymes, but they would happen so slowly that eventually the chemical reactions would be too slow and our body wouldn't be able to keep up with doing what it had to do, what it has to do. So in that way, enzymes are really vital. Okay, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit more information. As you can see, you don't have to know this specifically, but for those who are interested. All right, just took another sip of water there. Here we go. Talking all day now, getting, getting back into things. So again, you don't have to know this, but if you're wondering, the way that enzymes work is basically they lower the activation energy. So I know sometimes graphs, charts can scare you away, but let's be really simple. Let's say normally for a given chemical reaction, it takes this much energy to complete it. Maybe it's 10 ATP, maybe it's 20, whatever. Under normal conditions, it takes up to the red to complete it. Well, when an enzyme is present, that same chemical reaction can be completed with just this much energy. So because the enzyme lowers the amount of energy needed to do a given chemical reaction, that chemical reaction can happen more quickly. Just a little extra. Now, these things I would like you to know. Here are some characteristics of enzymes. Well, number one, they are specific. This means that each enzyme can only work on a specific thing. In our discussion, we can talk about nutrients. Amylase, as an enzyme, can only work on starch. Protease, as an enzyme, can only work on protein. Lipase can only work on fat, so they're specific. These pictures down below um, are trying to show you that it's a lock and a key, right? So whatever the given structure is of a fat, protein, or carb, it has to fit into a matching piece. Here it says you don't have to know the specific info. Maybe I was referring to the picture, but I actually would like you to know that enzymes are specific, and enzymes are also reusable. That just means that after they're used in a chemical reaction, they leave. They're not chemically altered by what they just did, and they can enter another one. So it's really nice and efficient that they can be reused. Here are some examples. You do not have to know these. What do you notice, though? The enzymes tend to end in the suffix ace, amylase, lipase, protease, lactase. 
So that's kind of a giveaway that it's uh, an enzyme. And there's a whole bunch, pyruvate kinase, creatine kinase, acetylcholinesterase, goes on and on. So here, I already mentioned amylase as an enzyme can only work on starch. So these are examples, but you do not have to know the specific enzymes. All right, now we're going to get talking about carbs, fat, and protein. Okay, so I'm going to try and narrow it down here. So carbohydrates go through the normal, traditional digestion and absorption that we already talked about. So this information up top is a review, nothing new. But what I want to point out is what is unique. So what is unique about carbohydrates is that it can be digested and absorbed the fastest. So out of all the energy-producing nutrients, carbs, fat, and sometimes protein, carbohydrates can be broken down and absorbed the quickest. And that's why they can produce the quickest energy. It's precisely because we can break them down so quickly that we can then quickly convert them into energy. So as an athlete, if you're exercising for over an hour in continuous duration and you need to replenish sugar electrolytes, that sugar is carbohydrates, well, the best thing to do would be to ingest... Let me go back here. The reason why we ingest sugar or carbohydrates during exercise is because it's the quickest energy source. It really wouldn't make sense if you're exercising for an hour continuously. It wouldn't make sense to bring in fat just takes too long to break down. You'll be done with the exercise before you can even break it down. But carbs? Huh. If we're exercising for long enough and we need to bring in something, carbs should be it. Why? Because they can be broken down the fastest and therefore they can provide energy the fastest. This is what I'm saying, right? So during an activity, we may want to give... Um, some Gatorade, which contains simple sugar, carbohydrates. I want to make a point here. Um, and I do, even though it says at the bottom, you don't have to know all of this. The only thing I want you to know is what I'm circling. The only time that you need to eat or drink during activity is if that activity is longer in continuous duration. A soccer game, you got two 45-minute halves. You do have a little break in the middle, but really it's pretty much 90 minutes, right? Almost continuous. Um, versus someone doing a 5K. 5K might take someone 19, 20, 25, 30 minutes. Um, if the duration is less than about an hour, I know it says 45, but let's, well, we'll keep the range, 45 to 60 minutes. If the activity is less than 45 to 60 minutes of continuous duration, you don't need to bring in something during because you already have enough sugar in you. Remember, your muscles have blood sugar right there. Your muscles have glycogen right there. So the only time we need to replenish during activity is if that activity is longer in duration. Okay. All righty. So here are some unique things about fat. So we just finished carbohydrates. One thing that was unique about carbohydrates is that uh, it can be broken down and absorbed and therefore provide energy the fastest. Well, what's unique about fats? Well, they take longer to break down. Some of the reasons they take longer to break down, they need some extra special, special stuff. Not only do they need enzymes, in order to digest and absorb fats, we need bile. And we talked about this, didn't we? Because where is bile produced? The liver helps to break down fats. Another added step is that instead of being absorbed directly into the bloodstream, fats in the small intestine are absorbed into something called the lacteals. Now, eventually these lacteals lead to the bloodstream, but this is just an added step. Um, I thought I had a picture. I don't have a picture right here. You can go back to the PowerPoint slide where we had the small intestine. You remember the small intestine wall had those big hairs called villi, right? And inside, inside the villi were blood vessels. So here's our arteries. 
blood vessels. Our veins will be blue. So inside these villi were arteries and veins. And then what happened was food, let's say it's carbs, inside the small intestine, they will get diffused through the small intestine wall into the bloodstream. That's absorption. But you see fats they are absorbed into something called the lacteals. Usually in pictures, they're shown as green. So in addition to these arteries and veins, we have these structures called lacteals. And they're technically part of the immune system. So when we absorb fats, fats have to be absorbed, again, through the small intestine wall, but this time into the lacteals. Now, those lacteals will eventually later meet up with the blood vessels, but it's an added step. This is why fats take longer. All right, something else that's unique about fats, and I think we've covered this before, but if we haven't, we're going to keep saying it over and over again. Even though it takes longer to break down and absorb and metabolize, once we do metabolize the fat, it provides the most energy. Your muscles love to burn fat because it gives us a whole ton of energy. Carbohydrates are quick, but they don't last as long. Fats take longer to get to, but once we do, they will last a much longer time, give us energy for a longer time. Again, slower to be absorbed, but give us the most energy. Um, when to ingest, don't worry about this now. When we get to the chapter on the triglycerides and fats, only in extreme endurance events would you need to consider bringing in fats during activity. Um, we're talking about half Ironmans, ultra marathons, whatevs. Four, five, six, 10, 12, 14 hours. Um, okay, so don't worry about that. All right, what about protein? So protein, just like fat, takes longer to digest and absorb. Something that is unique, but you don't have to know. If you look in the middle there, proteins require a special carrier. Um, so there is kind of an added step here, a, a specialty required to absorb that protein. So all we're going to say is um, protein, because it's more complex in structure, takes longer to digest and absorb than carbs. And don't forget, protein is not an, a significant energy source for the body. Protein functions to give us structure, protein structures to form chemicals, and then protein is only burned for energy as a last resort, somewhere between, under usual, usual circumstances, somewhere between 10 and 50% of all of our energy should come from protein. But that's it. Okay, we are going to have chapters later on the micronutrients. If you remember way back from chapter one, we defined the nutrients. Carbs, fat, and protein are macronutrients along with water because we need larger amounts of them each day versus vitamins and minerals, which are micronutrients because we don't need as much of them. They're still really important, but we just don't need as much. Here are some interesting points about vitamins and minerals and digestion. Let's just pick out a couple. Vitamins are actually not digested. Don't worry about the rest here. We don't have to break down vitamins. So you have vitamin C uh, in the orange juice. Even things like broccoli has vitamin C in it. You bring in some vitamin C, your body doesn't have to break it down. It can be absorbed in the same form that you ingested it in. With minerals, some are absorbed, some are not. So vitamins pretty much all get absorbed into the bloodstream. Minerals, some are absorbed, some aren't. But they can still have a function. Even if a mineral is not absorbed, uh, it can still have a role while it's in the body. It just may not be in the bloodstream. Everything else here is extra. All right. We already talked about the function of the large intestine. Large intestine reabsorbs a lot of water. 
Now here you can see we do reabsorb water in the small intestine as well. Actually quite a lot of it, actually the most. Um, but we didn't really talk about that, so don't worry about it. A simple point. You don't have to overcomplicate this. Hopefully you're with me here. Look, when you're dehydrated, if you haven't had enough to drink, the amount of water absorption going on in your body goes up. If you don't have enough water, your body is going to absorb and hold on to as much as it can. This is why you don't pee as much. When you're dehydrated, your body reabsorbs all that water, which means there's less to pee out. And I'm just going to be straight here. Versus what if you're overhydrated? Now, it's not really common. It's actually quite hard to overhydrate. But in certain circumstances, it could happen. Think about a marathon runner who is really, really trying to hydrate well. Well, it could be just as bad to overhydrate as underhydrate. If someone is overhydrated, their water absorption in their intestines will go down. Your body already has enough. So more water is lost through urine. Simple, don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. <laughs> Aha, beware, about to get super scientific. But you got me, so you are okay. So there's this principle called osmolarity. You might see it called osmolality with an L. Um, there are some minor differences. So here's an L, osmolality. Here's an R, osmolarity. We're going to use the terms interchangeably. So for our purposes, we can use them interchangeably. When we talk about rehydrating as an athlete, it's really important that we look at the specific composition of that beverage. I mean, water, we know water is good, right? Great. But when we get to trying to um, replenish sugar, replenish electrolytes, we get into things like Gatorade. So what we're going to talk about is this fluid content and something called osmolarity and is something like Gatorade actually the appropriate fluid content? All right. Um, okay. So osmolarity, I'm going to, so you can define osmolarity in many different ways. I'm going to define it in a way that is hopefully simple. We don't need to get into all the crazy specifics. We can be a little bit more general. We are going to define osmolarity as the, concentra the concentration of a solute in a solution. Let's give an example of two different types of Gatorade, right? Here we go. You know, you can buy Gatorade already in the bottle, but you can also, particularly if you're on a, a sports team or something, they may buy the powder. And then you add the Gatorade powder to water, right? So if we look at two different Gatorades, now, in a solution or in a fluid, we have a solute and a solvent. The solvent is almost always water. The solvent is what's present in higher amounts. In our body, our universal solvent is water. We got a lot of water in our bloodstream. It's present in more amounts than the blood cells. Uh, in a Gatorade, there's much more water than there is the sugar, the, the powder. So the solvent is what's present in a fluid in the highest amounts, usually water, which means that the solute is what is present in lowest amounts. And this is usually what we're dissolving in water. So in our example of Gatorade, we have the water, right? So here we have, let's see, here we have the water. And then mixed into that, use a different color just for the fun of it, mixed into that we're going to have sugar. The sugar powder of Gatorade, and that's the solute. 
So this is our solvent. There's more of it, usually water. And this is, in this example of a fluid, our solute. So on the left, we have one example. And then on the right, let's do another where we have the water. And then let's add some, okay. Let's add some sugar. Now, if both had the same amount of water, if, if our Gatorade A has the same amount of water as Gatorade B, which one has a higher concentration of solute? Which has more of the green X's? B, right? B has a higher amount of solutes. It has more sugar. Anything that has a higher amount of solutes has a higher osmolarity. What would this Gatorade taste like? Sweet. So just think of making your own Gatorade. Think of Kool-Aid, whatever powder and water drink you want to talk about. We have the water, the solvent, and the solute, the powder. In Gatorade, if we add a lot of sugar, we have a lot of solute, it's high in osmolarity, it would taste sweet. On the other hand, our example A has less solute and therefore has lower osmolarity, and it would taste more watery. So when you're thinking about osmolarity, look at the concentration of the solute. Think of Gatorade. If I add a lot of solute, it tastes sweet, high osmolarity. If I don't have as much solute, it will taste watery. Now, changing the solute is one way that we can alter osmolarity. But there's another way that we can alter osmolarity. So we can increase or decrease the solute, but we can also alter the water. Now it's harder to imagine in Gatorade because it's harder to take out the water without taking out the sugar too. But the example I'm about to give you here would be a really good example in the blood, right? But let's just keep going with our analogy of the Gatorade. All right, so remember, we had the same amount of water, same amount of water. This one has three sugar particles. This one has 10. Eight, one, two, three, four, eight, okay. Right now, we would say that B has a higher osmolarity because it has more solute. But another way that we can alter the osmolarity is by removing water. So I can also alter the amount of solvent. What if I remove some of this water, if it were possible? I still have the same three sugar particles, but I've taken away water. What's happening in that example? And maybe I should just do it the same here. You have to bear with me here. I'm still sometimes trying to explain this in the easiest way possible. It's kind of challenging. So we started with the same amount of water. And let's say we start with the same amount of sugar. Right now they're equal. Same amount of water, same amount of sugar. Now, what if I remove some of the water? What happens to the osmolarity of the Gatorade in A? If I remove the water but keep the solutes the same, I have a higher concentration of solute. The actual number of solute went down, but the concentration relative to the water went up. So by reducing the water, I've increased the osmolarity. Think back to our examples at the bottom. If I have Kool-Aid and I take water away, but I keep the same sugar, won't it taste sweeter? Upon removing some of the water but keeping the sugar, it'll actually taste sweeter. So you can increase osmolarity by increasing the number of solute or by decreasing the amount of solvent. On the other hand, I can decrease solute, excuse me, decrease osmolarity 
by decreasing the amount of solutes or by increasing the amount of water to it. This is an important concept, so make sure that you feel pretty good with it. Now, let's talk about Gatorade. Do we want the Gatorade to have a lot of solute and therefore have a higher osmolarity? Well, if we just think about it with common sense, we don't want the Gatorade to be overly sweet. That would be sickening. And if it's too sweet, it probably wouldn't be that good for our GI tract. But is there an appropriate osmolarity? As a matter of fact, there is. We want our osmolarity to be relatively high. Not too high, but relatively high. If we have osmolarity that's too high, it will delay gastric emptying. It's in red, so you should know it. What that means is, if the osmolarity is too high, if it's too sugary, it will delay gastric emptying. Your stomach will keep its contents longer longer than it should. This can absolutely lead to stomach and GI discomfort. Now, if you wanna apply some numbers, we could. The appropriate unit for osmolarity as it relates to a fluid is milliosmoles per liter. So we can do real science studies and we find that somewhere between an osmolarity of 200 to 400 milli milliosmoles per liter is the best. It's the best to allow for the Gatorade to be absorbed, the sugar from it to be absorbed, and to reduce potential GI distress. I don't have this number in red, so you don't have to know the number. It is an interesting reference. Here are some osmolarities. Look at Gatorade. Is Gatorade between 200 and 400 milliosmoles per liter? Sure is. So as a matter of fact, Gatorade is formulated pretty well. Now, some people like to dilute their Gatorade. I am one of them. So when I go out cycling or doing the Ironman or whatever, I like to dilute it a bit because I find that my stomach responds better if it's a little bit more dilute or lower in osmolarity. Other things, um, you know, look at fruit juice. Whoo, really high. Look at the sodas, really high. Even, um, I'm not sure, they still have all sport out there. That's too high. All right. Now, what about digestion and absorption during exercise? Being the Ironman athlete that I am, not a fast one, but this is something I'm intimately aware of. Um, you know, I think I mentioned this in our intro video, maybe not. But, you know, a lot of times athletes can get away with not having great nutrition. Do a sprint, run a 5K, pitch a baseball game. A lot of us, a lot of athletic activity, you can kind of get away with stuff, right? But there are some extreme situations where you really can't hide from it. And one example of that is the Ironman, right? This big, long triathlon. You're going to swim 2.4 miles, then you're going to bike 112 miles, and then you're going to run a marathon back to back to back. You better eat properly because if you do not, because you're just exercising for so long, uh, it will catch up with you, right? So here's someone famously in the 80s, um, Julie, I can't think of her last name at the moment, uh, had to crawl across the finish line of the Ironman um, she actually pooped her pants, a whole bunch of other stuff. This is an extra, and this picture is in black and white. This is a, a good reminder of not to wear white on, on race day. <laughs> but like I said, in these extreme endurance, particularly events, um, if you don't eat properly, you can absolutely end up in trouble. Okay, so things that affect gastric movement during exercise. I don't know why this arrow, it seems to have been misplaced when I brought it over here to my iPad. So just ignore that. Here's what I want to point out. When you exercise, as you're exercising, your GI activity goes down. You should know that. Because when we're exercising, your body will divert more energy, more blood flow to the muscles. 
Folks, your body is constantly diverting energy to where it's needed most. Of course, we always deliver some blood to every organ all the time. But if you're exercising, we don't need so much blood in our GI tract. Digestion of some of your food can wait. When you're exercising, we need to bring all that we can to those working muscles. So as a result, during exercise, our GI tract activity goes down. You're not digesting as much at as high of a rate. But, as I just said, even though it might be slower or less, it's still happening. So our GI tract doesn't shut down. It just slows down during exercise. All right. As we talk about this, I'm going to pull up my other PowerPoint because I just want to make sure that I'm putting the arrows in properly. So I apologize that the arrows didn't show up. Just give me one moment here. We're going to pull this up. If I can find it. Let's see. We'll just go up here. Thanks for being patient, folks. She can... Here we go, right here. Here we go. Here we go. Come on now, you can do it. All right. Geez, some, sometimes technology just takes forever and it sometimes makes things harder. All right, let me scroll down. All right, so here we go. There's other things that can affect gastric movement. When we bring in more volumes of fluid, if you bring in more water, you will empty more gastric juices. That's good. When we say gastric emptying, that just means um, contents move through GI tract. So when we drink a, a reasonable amount of water, it helps to move things through the GI tract. That is good. We don't want um, delayed gastric emptying. If your gastric emptying is delayed, things are going to stay longer in your GI organs, and that can cause discomfort. You can read about the intensity here. Um, Sometimes um, gastric emptying can go up. Sometimes it can go down based on the intensity. Um, you can read all about this. We can compare it during high intensity or during, in, during, sorry, during lower intensity or higher intermittent. If you read this carefully, look. Rate of gastric, rate of gastric emptying is not affected by exercise intensity under... 80% of your VO2 max. All that means is gastric emptying is not affected by lower intensity activity. So your lower intensity activities will usually not influence gastric emptying. But when we switch to really high intensity we can see a slowed gastric emptying. Okay, so in terms of intensity, lower intensity activities don't seem to slow or affect gastric emptying, but higher intensity exercise may slow gastric emptying, which just means food is not moving through your GI tract as quickly. Um, so yeah, so know those two. Um, this one is common sense. Um, gastric emptying can change based on conditions, right? Things like dehydration, um, stress levels, recent diet, altitude. All these things can also play a role. We mentioned osmolarity. Now here it's going to get a little confusing. So we've already defined gastric emptying. And now we're adding gastric secretions. So if a drink is really high in osmolarity, 
it will lower or slow gastric emptying. We already talked about that, didn't we? If osmolarity is too high, it will slow gastric emptying. If osmolarity is too high, it will slow gastric emptying. Things will not move through the GI tract as quickly. Too high of osmolarity, and this is too high, right? Too high of osmolarity will actually increase your gastric secretions. This would be like enzymes, hydrochloric acid. It's going to make things more juicy. And in this instance, that's not a good thing. We have plenty of enzymes, plenty of hydrochloric acid. But if you drink something that's too high in osmolarity, you will have more enzymes and hydrochloric acid, but be moving things through slower. It's a bad combination. Okay. What about carbs, fat, and protein? Fats tend to move through the GI tract the slowest. That's really what that is saying. So fats move through the GI tract the slowest. That's why you want to be careful. If you eat a lot of fat right before activity, that fat's going to be sticking around the GI tract. Not good. It's going to weigh you down. Stress. When we increase our stress, that also slows gastric emptying. So you see, when we have the proper osmolarity, when we're eating mostly carbs like we should, when we're at low stress, these are all things that keep our GI tract moving. But our GI tract contents will move slower, right? Reduce gastric emptying. Our contents will move slower when our osmolarity is too high, when we eat a lot of fat, and when we have more stress. Okay, so how do you avoid these things? Here are some of the recommendations. Now, any t GI distress period is more likely to occur during an endurance event. I don't think that's hard to understand why. You're just exercising for longer, more can go wrong. Here are some problems that could occur. And I bet a lot of you out there have experienced this. Sometimes it's from our diet choices. Sometimes it's from stress. Um, there can be a lot of things, right? But we're going to talk about what we can do with our diet choices to try and limit any GI problems. Um, something else that's interesting, you don't have to know it, but research seems to, seems to show as of now that these GI distress is more common in women. We're not quite sure why. What are the causes? Well, psychological, excuse me, physiological. So we already talked about this, stress, food choices that physiologically impact our GI tract. We already talked about that. How to avoid these physiological problems? Do proper food and timing. Ingest carbs, not fat, during exercise. Um, have the proper osmolarity of a sports drink. But there is such a thing as a simple mechanical effect. Think about an endurance athlete. You get a lot of jostling. And I hate to use that simple word, but it's kind of true. Your organs are like bumping up and down as you're running for 26.2 miles. It's crazy. Um, some of this just happens. One thing that seems to increase that feeling of our organs being jostled around is when you have a larger volume of food. So you don't want to eat too much before activity. Um, here are some other things that can increase your risk of GI distress. I already mentioned fats. We'll use green. Um, fiber. You definitely don't want to have a lot of fiber before an event because that moves things through your GI tract and helps you poo, but it could also back you up. Um, high concentration carbs. Wait a minute. High osmolarity. Bad. Too high of osmolarity. Um, so how to avoid? Basically, stick around. We, I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but as we go through each nutrient chapter, we will talk about things more specifically. All right. I'm going to leave you with, I know I'm aging myself here, but Bill Rogers, an American runner, um, way back in the day when marathoning first became really popular, 
Um, he had a quote in Sports Illustrated, more marathons are won or lost in the porta toilets, porta potties, than at the dinner table. So, indeed, if you don't take care of your nutrients, you could end up in the porta potty. All right, folks, good job. I will see you for the next chapter.